Today is Friday, February 9th, and earlier this week, the NTSB has released their preliminary report involving the crash of the air ambulance helicopter that claimed the lives of all three crew members on board. The aircraft was a Bell 206 L3 operated by Air Evac Life Team near Weatherford, Oklahoma. We're going to examine that report, look at the information that we know, and see if we can find out what happened. My name is Ian McCarthy, and this is Critical Angle. On January 20th, 2024, about 2323, it's almost midnight, Central Standard Time, a Bell 206 L3 helicopter, November 295 Alpha Echo, was substantially damaged when it was involved in an accident near Hydro, Oklahoma. The pilot, flight nurse, and flight paramedic were fatally injured, and it was operated under Part 135 of the Federal Aviation Regulations. The helicopter dropped off a patient at the Mercy Health Center heliport, identifier OL16, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and the crew was returning to their home base, Air Evac 112 Heliport 40K1, Weatherford, Oklahoma. The company GPS monitoring program stopped tracking the helicopter at about 11.30 p.m., and a search began for the helicopter at that point. The wreckage was located in an open pasture about 1.5 miles east of Hydro, Oklahoma. A preliminary review of the Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, or ADSB, data Capture the accident flight as it departed OL-16 and flew west towards Weatherford between 500 feet and 600 feet above ground level at about 110 knots ground speed. The last ADSB point was at 2323 and 39 seconds, about 210 feet east of the main wreckage location. Accident investigators did find carcasses of several geese located in the debris field as well as one embedded in the flight control servo. Samples of the geese feathers were recovered for more detailed identification. This is what they're talking about here. So in the uh, top uh, fairing of the uh, Bell 206, uh, you're going to have these hydraulic servos right here. And essentially what this is doing is uh, taking the input from the pilot, the cyclic and the collective, to go you know, forward and backwards, left, right, up and down. Uh, it's using these hydraulic rams to essentially increase that input uh, strength because if you were to try to move this rotor head with no hydraulics, the forces would be immense. If these large animals cause damage to this flight servo or any of these flight controls, uh, that could have led to loss of control from the pilot, and essentially there's not much that he would have been able to do at that point. All major components of the helicopter were located at the accident site. The main wreckage consisted of the fuselage, engine, and tail rotor. The transmission had separated from the fuselage and was located at the site. The white main rotor blade was fractured, found in an adjacent field. The red main rotor blade was also fractured and found near the main rotor hub. The mass nut has separated and located in the debris field as well. Now here we have an overhead view of the crash site with the main wreckage on the left. The yellow line is the ADSB track that the helicopter flew. Um, and then these are various pieces essentially recovered from the investigators on scene. Notice these are markings of the geese carcasses that were found, not including the ones that were on the wreckage itself, but these were located some distance away. But notice how much kinetic energy is involved here. I mean, this one of the blades was thrown way out here to this other field, and it's actually quite incredible that they found some of these these smaller parts. A review of the U.S. Air Force's Avian Hazard Advisory System found the probability of bird activity low in the vicinity of the accident. So this goes to show, even though in, in EMS, myself, I'm an EMS pilot, you know, BirdCast uh, is a website that we often check, uh, you know, looking for migratory bird information. Even if it's low, that doesn't mean that there is no danger of, of striking birds. Now, if we look at the uh, just the basic information, um, more importantly, the, the weather information, uh, visual meteorological conditions existed at the time of the accident. Uh, there were no clouds, 10-mile um, visibility, light winds at 7 knots. It was cold, negative 7 degrees Celsius, but uh, negative 14 was the dew point, so there was a large spread in there, which uh, would be unlikely to have any kind of fog or reduced visibility. And that's it for the report. Now, if we if we look at the track of the aircraft in four flight we can see this was the projected route from mercy to their base near weatherford along this route if we also look at adsb data on flight aware we can see the altitude recorded of the aircraft 
uh, if you go, it's it started at look like about 1500 feet. And one thing to keep in mind too with this is that um, this data can often be wrong. It's not exact. Uh, this is just the information we're getting. Usually though, if the aircraft is flying at a low altitude or is farther outside of range of a tower, uh, you may get incomplete data. But what we're getting here is a general airspeed and altitude. Uh, at 1,500 feet and approximately a third into the flight, the pilot increased altitude to 1,700 feet MSL. Now, the important thing to remember that this is above sea level. This is not above the ground. So if we look at the flight path and we can look at, for example, Sundance Airport has an elevation of almost 1,200 feet. Well, if the pilot is at 1,500 feet over top of that, then that would give them about 300 feet above the ground, which is below uh, pretty much any EMS company's minimums for nighttime. I know air methods of the company I work for has a bare minimum of 500 feet unless you're takeoff and landing, and they really want you to be above 1,000 feet. I have contacts at AeriVec as well, and they have told me that they have the same minimum. So unsure why the pilot was flying at such a low altitude, uh, especially considering some of these towers. Um, I mean, you have, here's a tower right along the route at 1840 that uh, is higher elevation than any of the altitudes we have reported in ADSB data. Again, uns unsure with the low altitude, especially for this leg, which is about 52 nautical miles, and a 206, that would be almost 30 minutes of flight. Um, so, you know, one thing about flying low is that in nighttime, you know, it's even it's even more dangerous because well we can't see as well. Now in in the air medical field we fly with night vision at night. However, you know, it's it's still reduced visibility. You know oftentimes some of these newer towers that have LED lights, they can't be seen under night vision. Just the the way that the light emitting diode is just not just not picked up on there. Now the old the old style incandescent lights we can see very well, but you also have to be scanning under your night vision goggles in order to see these new LED lights that are almost invisible under the MVGs. Now, the pilot did increase altitude, but that is most likely due to uh, these elevations increasing as well. So you can see from, if we look at Sundance from earlier, about 1,200 feet, a lot of these airports around the route are now at 1,400, 1,500 feet. So the pilot would have to increase that altitude in order to maintain that at least, you know, 300 feet above the ground, which again, is still below the company minimums. This is the approximate area of the impact near hydro. So uh, getting getting pretty close to base. This is the same picture from the NTSB report. Uh, this is the field where the aircraft went down in, and this is the tree line uh, that most likely had these birds contained within it. You know, at coming over at that low altitude, may have scared up the birds into flight, which would have, could have caused the impact. And I'm also not saying that it's, you know, flying at higher altitude avoids these birds altogether. I myself have encountered birds at five, 6,000 feet before at night. Um, thankfully, I didn't hit them, but you come up on these birds very closely. And even with modern landing lights that are LED that you can run constantly, you're not going to get much time at the speeds we travel. Um, again, they were going 100. 25 miles an hour approximately things come up on you pretty quick especially at the lower altitudes if we look at this study from falcon environmental services um, again this is mostly mostly referencing airplanes but it's the data still uh, is relevant because you know the lower altitudes especially this zero to 100 feet typically this low it's because the birds are being scared from either the surface or if you're flying over or near water a lot of times birds will come in and rest in the water the helicopter is obviously very loud. It will scare these birds. Uh, so you definitely have to exercise extreme caution. You know, there's there's many reasons at night why you might want to fly a little bit higher than during the day. Birds obviously are a big, big reason. Uh, obstacles, visibility, things like that. In the event of an engine failure with a single engine helicopter, uh, it'll give you more time to find a spot to auto rotate to or any kind of emergency really. It just gives you a little bit more time um, and a little bit more leeway, you know, because you're not so close to the ground. Even in an auto rotation, the, the descent rates that were coming down, even 2,000 feet, can go by very quickly. A high percentage of these strikes occur on or immediately adjacent to airport properties, again, is because that's typically where aircraft are the lowest. 
right? So above 500 feet, the number of bird strike decreases proportionally as altitude increases. So, you know, the higher you go up, the, the less likely you are to hit birds. Again, it doesn't, doesn't eliminate the risk, we, and we can't really eliminate all risks in this business. We try to mitigate the best we can. If we look at this sliding scale, likelihood of bird strike decreases dramatically, especially as, as we started getting above, you know, about 3,000 feet. Um, again, 3,000 is probably not as practical for a shorter leg like this, but you know, even if the distance between... 1,000 to 2,000 feet, you know, look at how dramatically you can decrease your chances or likelihood of impacting birds or encountering birds. The impact with geese is the obvious culprit for this fatal accident, but I can't help but ask, were there other factors involved that contributed to this? Could flying at a higher altitude have reduced the risk of this incident occurring? Maybe. We can't eliminate risk in this industry, but we can do everything possible to reduce it. When we read the reports of these accidents, it's always difficult for everyone in this industry because we live this every day, and you can't help but thinking that it could just as easily have been you. My heart definitely goes out to the families and friends of the crew members involved. It's a very sad situation. And as pilots, the best that we can do to honor these crew members is keep them in your mind when you fly and try to mitigate risk in the best way you possibly can. Thank you for watching, and be safe out there.